Welcome to the campus of North Idaho College and today's broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. Welcome to the third program in a six-part series on the subject DNA research and genetic engineering in particular. For you who are with us over the past two weeks, we dealt with the ethical questions that arise from genetic engineering and DNA research. I hope that we left a lot of thoughts with you uh, to consider. Today and again next week, we're very fortunate to have with us a guest that will deal with the public policy questions that arise from this very important topic. What kind of public policy, if any, should we have? And what level of government should deal with this very important question? In order to accomplish that goal uh, for our staff and our institution, we wish to welcome to the program Dr. Robert H. Blank, who is the chairman of the Department of Political Science at the University of Idaho in Moscow. Our guest holds a baccalaureate degree from Purdue University and a master's degree and PhD degree from the University of Maryland, receiving his doctorate in 1971. Our guest has also been a scholar in residence at the Center for Biopolitical Research and was a senior Fulbright lecturer in the Republic of China in 1976 and 77. Our guest has also published uh, both in the form of articles and books. His books include uh, such titles as Regional Diversity of Political Values, Idaho Political Culture, a book entitled Political Parties and Introduction, and the one that is uh, most important to our subject matter that will be coming out in April, and we would invite you to get that book. It is entitled, The Political Implications of Human Genetic Technology. Uh, in the next two weeks after this, we'll deal with some of the research with the scientists. Uh, Dr. Blank, I want to express on behalf of our staff our great appreciation for your appearance here today. Oh, thank you. Joining with me in questioning our guests on this very important topic are the same panel members that we used over the past two weeks. First of all is Richard Snyder from the faculty of North Idaho College, Bob Mary also on that faculty, and Father Bill Wasmuth from the St. Pius Catholic Church in Coeur d'Alene. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, we'll invite Richard Snyder to commence the questioning. Dr. Blank, um, after dealing with Bruce Hilton on the ethics of genetic engineering and allied uh, concepts, I came to the conclusion that this nation needs to search itself in terms of the ethical questions involving genetic engineering. And suppose, suppose we do that, and, and the majority of us in this country decide how we stand on these issues, it would seem to me that the next step is public policy somehow bringing together of this thinking into the policies of a society. And, and I'm curious, from the point of view of a political scientist, do you think that we have the political right to regulate genetic engineering that may go on in the future or is going on now, particularly genetic engineering that is uh, functioning within free enterprise, uh, stock on the markets and things like that? Um, I don't know if we have a right uh, to do this. I think. Uh, one of the problems that arises is that much of the technology that I would include in genetic engineering, which would be much broader than, say, recombinant DNA research, um, has already been funded by the federal government at one stage or another. And I think at that stage that it becomes a responsibility of the decision makers to decide if the, if the public funds or the public monies are being spent in a way that, that would be acceptable not only to a majority of the citizens, but um, to a, I suppose, a, um, a broader, uh, or at least reflect the broader values, the broader ethical framework uh, of those citizens. I, I think that um, the government will have a very difficult time doing this, however, because of the nature of the political issues that arise from it. The, the the controversial nature of these issues. But, uh, but I do think that the government has not only a right uh, to, to become involved, but a duty to become involved or a responsibility to its citizens to, 
to uh, to educate them and to to make them aware of what's happening. Now, if those citizens then decide through their representatives that they would rather not know what's happening, I suppose that's up to them. But C could I pursue this just yeah, a little sure. farther then? Uh, in your own mind, do you have um, any particular institutions within our culture that you think would be ripe for dealing with this process? Uh, you've expressed elsewhere that perhaps the United States Congress is not structured in a way that could really deal with some of these issues. Uh, where do you see the, the kinds of uh, small controls and concerns coming from? Uh, well, certainly there isn't any one body that's going to, to be able to supply all of the public policy uh, decisions in this area. I think it's going to take uh, perhaps a restructuring of some president's in institutions as well as the creation of perhaps a permanent national commission on this area and perhaps a series of permanent national commissions on more specific areas, for instance, uh, one on gender preselection techniques and one on prenatal diagnosis and one on uh, carrier screening and so forth. Uh, these bodies would have to, however, be different than the present national commissions, which are of short tenure, which produce one report and then go out of business. Um, some people have suggested that we could have a Supreme Court type body that would make not final decisions on these areas, uh, on, on these particular technologies, but uh, to publicize them and uh, allow um, the public to see the options and then have some mechanism by which the public or their representatives would select those alternatives which, which seem most reasonable and most acceptable. So that would be the, the way, although certainly that doesn't answer all of the, the problems, I'm sure. Bob Mary. Following sort of along with this, re relying on people to feed in their wants, their dis-wants, mm -hmm. their dislikes again, uh, we always have a certain group that's very vocal and another group that sits back. So really the politicians would be getting a lopsided thing. I guess am I asking, is it best that we not know what's going on? How do we know what's best? I mean, we're, we're reaching a situation, how do we know what's best 30 years from now? and we're going to decide it politically in a ball game, give and take. I and is that the right place for it? Well, that might not be the right place for it, but I think, uh, as I mentioned in my talk before, I think that we're at the stage where it's very difficult to, to pull it out of that area. Uh, that it seems like once we get whatever uh, technology into the public spectrum, into the social area, that it becomes impossible to pretend that it doesn't exist or pretend that it that we can take it out and put it back in. So I think it's there. I don't I don't think we have a choice. Uh, we we have a tendency I think as technology progresses and progresses as I said you know, at a very accelerated pace um, well we lose the luxury of being able to have that long lag time or long lead time and to plan. And I think the problem that we have now is not that the technologies at this point are a crisis. I, I think that the kinds of discussions we're having here indicate that um, that they can be you know can be examined and analyzed and and come up with some type of conclusions. I do think, however, that if decisions, perhaps this maybe not even decisions, just the discussion of national goals. What what would we like to see happen in the future? Uh, do we feel that genetic intervention is something that is either uh, acceptable? Um, or justifiable, I think those are the kinds of issues now. Whether or not we use a particular technology or whether or not we put so much dollars into this technology, I think are much less important than the long-term goals. Uh, wh where do we uh, see ourselves in 30 years and how do we get there, I think is a better question than trying to make a decision now um, and, and plan what we're going to do definitely in 30 years. So I, I think that we have to discuss them. I think that it has to be um, considered part of the public spectrum. Um, and I don't see this in quite probably the negative ways. I mean, I, I see it as, as a realistic type of thing and we have to deal with it. And I do believe that these are the issues that are going to be most crucial, most sensitive, maybe 10 years, 15, 20 years. Um, but I think it's national goals or directions more than specific decisions. Father Waltzman. I think it's safe to say that the 
politics have kind of a bad name in most of our <laughs> country today. Um, and that many would say, when you're talking about something like genetic engineering, to move that into the political sphere, uh, or to have politics involved in that sphere, whichever way around you want to go, is uh, making a confusing thing even more difficult. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take a shot at turning that around and seeing if you can uh, say what politics is in a good sense that would be of help to us in this? Well, I'm not so sure that I could turn that around and uh, say that politics would be all good in this particular decision. I think without bringing it into the political realm, and what I mean by the political realm here is an area where the public, defined in obviously very ambiguous terms, but something out there broader than the particular interest involved is going to have some say over, or at least uh, some input in, into the decisions as to what will be done. And I, I think it is good, um, and I think, our, well, at least our country, um, a democracy is based on that idea that it's good, but even getting away from that idealistic type of, of democracy, I think, is very healthy, especially in areas that are so sensitive from an ethical, moral s sense, which you've already discussed. Um, uh, I think that it's important that everybody get their say, and um, that it be as open as a discussion as possible on the, uh, in a public sphere. Um, without that, I think the alternative is such that it might be suggested corporations would be setting up their own genetic divisions, mm -hmm. which is already happening. Um, and uh, I, I see the, the lack of government intervention is, is disastrous. I see the, the government intervention is perhaps not the best of all worlds, but at least prese presenting some type of uh, standards of possibility of input of individuals that otherwise would not be uh, put into the system. I, I think it is very difficult, um, as we talked about before, as to what ways this will be accomplished. But some of these have already happened. Um, pr programs of this type, I think, uh, um, hearings of the government on particular type of technologies have occurred. Um, there are ways of more direct kinds of referendums on this. Uh, for instance, as um, the biomedical technologies have uh, accelerated, we also have uh, the communications technology and computer technology has expanded as well. And so it is possible at least to get some broad kinds of referendums in the future, I think the very near future, in terms of direct uh, voting through television and that type of thing. I know it's been tested in Columbus, Ohio. And um, that, again, doesn't solve these broad, difficult ethical questions, but I think it allows some more input from a wider range of people than simply um, a few philosophers and a few technicians uh, making these types of decisions. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've joined our program in progress, our guest today is Dr. Robert Blank, the chairman of the Department of Political Science at the University of Idaho. This week and next week, he's discussing with us the public policy issues that come out of DNA research and genetic engineering. Uh, for you who've been following us over the past few weeks, we're dealing with this over a six weeks period. Uh, Dr. Blank, I have a question that, that comes to my mind from your presentation to the students of our institution. Uh, I was somewhat under the false impression, and maybe our viewers are also, that government at any level had not done very much with this subject yet, and that we were going to discuss what should government do in the future, mm -hmm. and that certainly is a part of the discussion. But from your presentation, I learned that both federal and state governments are involved, and I wish you would take some time to inform our viewers, both in the form of legislation and court decisions, some examples of what is already being done uh, with uh, this whole question with policies at this time. Okay. Glad to. Uh, the first major legislation in terms of genetic screening occurred in the early 1960s uh, when a uh, researcher named Guthrie uh, discovered a test for fetal ketonuria, or, or PKU. And within about five years, uh, I believe by 1967, uh, over 40 states had a mandatory screening of newborn infants for, for PKU. Uh, at the present point in time, 43 states uh, have mandatory screening programs. All, all, ch all newborns are, are given a blood test for PKU, except f under certain religious um, limitations. But, and the other seven states have programs, except they're not mandatory. And they are not, uh, s s well, they're not statutory. They have programs administrative. Um, 
In the, in the late 1960s um, and early 1970s, there was much uh, uh, impetus for screening of sickle cell anemia. And at one point in time, there were, I believe, 17 states had either compulsory screening of, of young black children or um, fairly strict voluntary programs. Um, in the 1973 or 4, the national government, the federal government passed the National Sickle Cell Disease Control Act, which said that states could get certain federal monies, but that the programs would have to be voluntary. So at this point in time, there are about 18 states, I believe, with voluntary sickle cell programs. Um, there are also states, well, some of the states that had the PKU screening have now added tests for galactosemia and about, and some of them have up to 18 different metabolic tests. So, so those are, that's basically the state legislation. Um, also, we have had uh, on the books in many states for years legislation concerning sterilization, which, as I mentioned in, in my talk, uh, are related to eugenic programs, which somewhat overlaps. In terms of court decisions, we had the decision last year, uh, Chakrabarty versus Diamond, where the Supreme Court ruled on very narrow technical patent law grounds that, that new life forms could be patented under existing patent laws. However, the Supreme Court at that time suggested that Congress should um, look into the moral uh, implications of uh, creation of new life forms. But, so the Supreme Court ruled then that patents could could be taken, and what that resulted in was um, a, a creation of a whole series of new uh, genetic corporations. Genentech uh, was the first, and I think they've been followed by uh, Bioscience and Biogen, and a whole series of corporations have been formed. And also, several of the large co uh, corporations in the United States have formed their own genetic, uh, I don't know if they call them divisions yet, but they have their own genetics coming in. Um, there have been other Supreme Court decisions related to uh, uh, life-death matters. The Roe versus Wade on abortion certainly has great implications for prenatal diagnosis. Um, there was a decision just recently in California, Curlinger versus Bioscience, that the appeals court in California suggested that, um, that children could sue uh, physicians for for injuries that they sustained prior to being born. Um, up until that point in time, the court didn't allow that. So those types of decisions, although they don't directly involve um, genetic technology, have great implications for the use of genetic technology. And there have been others, but I think those are the major ones. Thank you. Richard Snyder. Dr. Blank, what about surrogate mothers? Uh, what are the the legal and political problems surrounding um, the surrogate mother, one woman carrying the child of two other people, and then at termination handing the child back. Well, uh, the, the legal implications, as you mentioned, are, are quite complex because the possibility of combinations are, are unlimited, especially with in vitro fertilization where you could have the egg of the natural mother combined with the sperm of a donor and implanted in the womb of a surrogate mother, and you have a whole series of legal questions there. Or you could have the egg of one a donor and the sperm of another donor implanted in, the, in another woman and then a surrogate mother provided uh, uh, for the people who are paying for it. And so you run into a whole series of uh, legal questions on contracts because most of this would be done by contracts. But there are there are more questions. For instance, I if uh, a surrogate mother is carrying your child, you probably would be done for pay. I can't imagine that you know this would be the kind of thing that would be done without. But say it's done for pay, a contract would probably be written up. Now, can that surrogate mother you know have a drink or or smoke or could that be written into the contract? I suppose that could all be written in. Uh, there's the whole. Uh, aspect there. What if the baby is born with some kind of genetic defect? Then uh, whose responsibility and uh, what happened under those circumstances also is, is a legal question. I think the moral questions are, are perhaps even more interesting uh, in terms of, uh, you know, this possibility of creating a class, or I guess moral social question, creating a class of surrogate mothers to carry children for women who would otherwise simply not want to for convenience sake. And um, 
there have been some suggestions that a distinction be made between women who could not, because of physiological reasons, carry a child versus those who simply don't want to for career or convenience purposes, but I don't think that's practical. Um, what it amounts to is a, is, a, is a very, very sticky legal, moral, and social question uh, coming out of the technologies that have you know, been derived from artificial insemination and vitro fertilization. Um, and it, a surrogate mother now uh, is, is a reality. In fact, there have been you know, quite a few articles written coming from the, or coming from the artificial insemination. Um, the question of what happens if, that, if the surrogate mother decides later to keep the child, I think, is, a, is a, the psychological mm -hmm. kinds of questions that arise are very difficult. But the combinations now, there is no biological reason, as I understand, uh, at least that, that I've heard, why the egg of a woman um, implanted in another woman wouldn't, you know, why there be any difference where uh, that egg is implanted. So biologically, there's probably not a difference, but socially and legally and uh, ethically, there certainly is. I think it's a, a very major area of concern. Bob Mary, may I ask who legally is the mother under the law of this child, the one who gives birth or the one who provides the egg? Um, I don't know. Uh, there was one court decision that I heard about just about two or three weeks ago, um, but I don't think it had. I don't think that was the aspect involved. Um, I do know that uh, the California is the only state where the the donor of sperm in artificial <coughs> insemination cannot be sued uh, as the natural father. In other words, in most of the states, even that is ambiguous as to what responsibility that the donor of sperm from a sperm bank or wherever else have. Uh, it's an area where there has been very little um, concrete um, legal uh, decision and there's been no legislation except in California where some of those are more defined and I would expect California if they followed through on that would follow through with with egg transplants and so forth as well but in that case, then, I suppose it would be the person carrying it. Uh, if they follow through with their, their decision on the sperm and said that an egg is just like a sperm and whoever's carrying it would be, but I don't know. It's Do most people turn to adoption then for their child? Well, one of the, one of the reasons, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. I mean, to adopt their own child, I thought basically. Of that, uh, that one of the reasons that this is becoming such an important area, uh, the surrogate motherhood, or, or an area that has more and more important, and why artificial insemination and in vitro fertilization are becoming more important, is that there are so few babies to be adopted uh, that many people who in the past would have simply adopted now are, are moving towards uh, reproductive technology such as in vitro fertilization or artificial insemination. These people are paying uh, I, I, the in vitro fertilization I know of in, in North Carolina at Norfolk. They're paying twelve to fifteen thousand dollars just for a chance at it. That, that's not guaranteeing they'll have a child. So these people are, are willing to pay a lot of money to have a child, and it means a lot to them. And so this is an area where the technology has great benefits for those individuals. Um, and uh, part of the reason is because of social changes in social values and so forth in the result in ad on adoptions. May so I it's tied together. May I ask a yes or no question? Do these people who have paid this fee for this surrogate mother then in turn have to turn around and adopt the child she has produced for them to avoid all legal ramifications? That's what I'm asking. I, I can't answer yes or no because oh, I don't know. No I can't okay. know. I don't, I don't know. But I assume that would be set in a contract. Uh, the contracts, are, as I understand, are becoming very complicated. So I don't know. But uh, I don't know. I guess that would be best. Father Wassman. Kind of building on that uh, discussion of surrogate mothers, uh, mm -hmm. you commented elsewhere that having the technology and how we use it in its application is two different things. And you know, do we use the procedure in these cases and not in these? And it gets down to a motivation or a why are you going about it kind of question. Seems to me that public uh, political realm is not very successful in dealing with the motivation question on any fronts. Uh, I wonder if you'd comment about that in relation to. 
I, I think that that's a very accurate statement. Um, and I assume what you're implying is that getting back to the idea of the public role, uh, I, I think one of the, the means by which we have attempted to look at motivation in the past has been through the court system. In other words, in, in some cases, whether it's a murder or whatever else, uh, they look at the situation surrounding it and the motivation for doing it and so forth. Um, and some people have suggested, as I mentioned, in terms of surrogate motherhood, that if the motivation is for convenience of the mother, that uh, then we wouldn't allow surrogate motherhood. If it was for uh, to overcome infertility, it would. Um, I don't think that would work uh, from a policy standpoint. Um, just like I don't think it would work in terms of, say, sex preselection, um, that women who wanted to have an abortion for convenience could have it, but they couldn't have it if it was for uh, eliminating all female fetuses or all, all male fetuses. Um, I don't think that motivation does fit into public policy, and I, and I think that's one of the dangers uh, of looking at public policy. But on the other hand, uh, I mean, in other words, there are going to be some circumstances, I think, where people are go not going to be able to do something even though their, their reason for doing it is a good reason, and some people will probably be doing things even though their reason for doing it is a bad uh, reason. But I, I think that's probably one of the dangers of, of any decision that we make uh, in a uh, political system. Um, I'd rather not see it that way, but uh, like I say, I don't think, I think the realistics of the situation are that we're in the public policy realm already, and we're not going to, to bring it back out. And I think if, if, if we weren't already, Roe versus Wade put us in, put all of this, all of these matters into a public policy area. Does that mean then that the motivation area gets down to individuals, and basically what the political system can say is that this technology is okay, uh, it, it is usable, for example, and then it's down to the individual usage to say, well, I can justify it for this reason or I can't for that reason? Well, I, I think we do have to distinguish between the ethical and then the political legal. And I think I w would suggest that the ethical is what you're talking about. And I know many times what is legal and what is done politically certainly is of great question ethically. And I think one of the problems that, rise, uh, uh, that, is, that is raised here in terms of all of these technologies is that the values, uh, the ethical frameworks of the individuals looking at it are going to be so different. And perhaps what we're going to find is that the government, and this is what's happened so far, is that many of the decision makers have just said it's too, it's too hot politically to handle. So we're just going to ignore it. I must interrupt. I'm sorry we're out of time. We will okay. continue this next week. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been Dr. Robert Blank, who chairs the Department of Political Science at the University of Idaho. We're discussing public policy and genetic engineering and DNA, re DNA research. Please be with us next week, and we shall continue. Have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. <laughs>
Welcome to the campus of North Idaho College and today's broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. to the fourth program in a six-part series on DNA research and genetic engineering. For you viewers who were with us last week, you will recall that Dr. Robert H. Blank, the chairman of the Department of Political Science at the University of Idaho, is with us uh, both last week and again today. We're discussing the question of public policy and its role within this very important issue of genetic engineering and DNA research. We dealt with several questions. Uh, concerning what government has done up until this point, and with, on this program we'll deal with the future and uh, some other uh, developments that are taking place at the present time. Our guest, in addition to being chairman of the Department of Political Science at the University of Idaho, is a, has been a scholar in residence at the Center for Biopolitical Research. He's been a senior Fulbright lecturer, and he's a published author. His books include uh, several, but the one that we're most interested in for this show is entitled The Political Implications of Human Genetic Technology, which will be out in April, uh, and we invite you uh, to look forward to that book. Uh, Dr. Blank, welcome back to the program. Mm -hmm. Joining with me in questioning our guest today will be the panel from last week. From the fact of North Idaho College, we have Richard Snyder in Anthropology and Bob Mary in the Biological Sciences, and we're happy to welcome to the program. The third panel member is Father Bill Wathmuth of St. Pius Catholic Church in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, Richard Snyder, you're invited to commence the questioning. Thank you. Dr. Blank, <clears throat> I'm an anthropologist and I have more than just a fascination with evolutionary processes. And since evolution is a change in gene frequencies in a population from one generation to the next, uh, could it not be true that through the use of genetic engineering, we could in fact be tampering with evolution? That is, in the creation of offspring, uh, either by removing deleterious genes or some form of selective factor in which we choose to uh, have boy babies rather than girl babies, we are altering the genetic composition of the next generation. And I'm curious if that next generation or succeeding generations after that have any legal claim on us. Not that they could turn around at some time in the future and sue us in our graves, but could you visualize uh, court decisions uh, acting in the best interest of future generations to stop us today from doing certain things? I haven't seen anything that I that you know even the hypothetical case that would relate directly to to your question um, I do I do think it raises some questions about the extent to which we ought to you know inter interfere or intervene in, in the genetic process um, and there have been some suggestions for instance of if we do select for gender that there's going to be seven percent more males and that this will have a uh, you know, great implications for future generations. There have also been some suggestions that if we attempt to reduce genetic diversity that we're setting ourselves up for some disaster down the line. So I think that from a realistic standpoint that, that there could be uh, some, some justification perhaps for that. I don't think that the way our court system works, is, which is a passive uh, system and it's also retrospective, in other words, it's it, it, it is not a system where you can sue from the future back. It, it has to be some past uh, damage claim. Um, there is a set of, of um, cases, however, <coughs> that relate to this and have, have more potential mm -hmm. there, and that is the torts for wrongful life, which uh, I mentioned briefly in my talk, uh, relate to whether a child can sue a parent or p sue the parents for being born with a particular type of disorder. There was a case in, 
in Florida where the parents were sued for psychological damages, child lost. There have been cases in other states where the, the child or the child's guardian, uh, some lawyer who needed work or something, uh, sued the parents for, um, for, dam for children born with congenital diseases, and they lost. Um, however, with prenatal diagnosis and with uh, the means now of, uh, of identifying before birth these many diseases and disorders, it is at least theoretically possible that a parent who is sued in the future by a child for, say, being born with Down syndrome may in fact lose the case because first of all the damages have have been performed and now there's the question of whether the parents knew uh, what they were, were doing. Uh, in other words, if the doctor says you should have amniocentesis because you're 40 years old and the chances of Down syndrome are 1 in 35 or whatever they are, I think they're about that, uh, over 40, uh, and the woman says yes and she has it and then they diagnose the, the fetus as having Down syndrome, but then the mother says no, I'm not going to abort it. The courts may look at that differently, and my a fear that I would have there is that that, in fact, would, would lead to a, a very subtle but a very real eugenic type of process where, wherein parents would be making decisions on the basis of that court decision rather than... So I, I could see that as kind of theoretically mm -hmm. tied mm -hmm. to future generations suing, and I think it would, all it would take is a couple cases like that and you'd find much more caution on the part of some parents. Uh, it, it would also create a very difficult situation to give children suing parents for, for damages for, for that. And then you raise a question of, does that mean that any child that has any problem uh, can sue the parents because the, the child isn't perfect? And, and where, does that, you know, where do you stop? And, and I, I think it would be a very dangerous thing, but uh, I think it's theoretically possible. Uh, could happen. Also, one other thing is that the cases that have been solved in, in this or looked at in this area of, of wrongful birth, where children have or where parents have sued physicians for either not giving them information about amniocentesis or or misdiagnosing it, that they have won damages um, for the care of, of those of those children. And what this has done is it has made physicians much more conscious about amniocentesis, and so it has had a much broader impact in, in these. And it has resulted in a w different way of looking at prenatal diagnosis. Bob Mary. From accounts that I've read and some from personal experience, parents who quite often have a defective child all of a sudden develop a burning desire to produce a normal child. Mm -hmm. And with genetic counseling today, quite often they can be given the odds yes. of producing it, the same type of defect again. But I, I've read as a case in, or a situation in New York where parents had produced a defective child, were diagnosed as carriers, and were given very, very poor odds of producing a normal child, but chose to have a second child, of which also had the defect, and went on to have a third child, which also had the defect. And at this time, it, they were expecting child four, and the state of New York was questioning whether the public should spend money to help keep these children that they were producing alive as any state tackled limitations mm -hmm. for parents who seem to consistently go against the odds, but yet expect the public to pick up the tab for these things. Has anybody tried it? <laughs> uh, uh, again, it's somewhat out of the area that I'm familiar with, but uh, it certainly brings up a question of public policy, I mean, uh, direct public policy, and also some extremely important ethical kinds of decisions, it puts directly in conflict the rights of those parents to continue to procreate as they wish versus the rights of others in society uh, not to have to pay for what the parents are doing. And I think that uh, given the uh, constraints on budgets and so forth, that you have to look at the rights of those parents I myself would say that we have to look at them very, very closely because it isn't simply the rights of those parents versus some ambiguous society out there. It usually means that those uh, children, and I don't know what the d disease or defect was here, but uh, if, say, they were severely mentally retarded, uh, which
which would probably cost uh, ten, twelve thousand dollars a year to to care for them. Um, you take that thirty, forty thousand, whatever it costs to care for three or four of those children uh, a year, and, and then you look at how much that would do in terms of, say, providing nutrition uh, to to pregnant women uh, to overcome less severe types of um, uh, birth defects or retardation. And you find that it's not a balancing out of uh, those three children and the rights of the parents versus ambiguous society, but some very real political decisions. And I think those are the areas where often the legislators or the courts end up making very unpopular decisions from one standpoint, but on the other hand, probably, uh, you know, decisions that have to be made by somebody. But it, it certainly, it brings up the whole question of the, to what extent parents have rights to to have children. Um, that's a very unusual case, I, I would think, though. I think I would hate to see that as, as used as a, a sort of a general kind of thing, but it certainly brings up some of the implications of rights and the extent to which one has rights. Father Wasserman. Part of the role, for sure, of society, legal system, pol political system is to uh, promote the rights of those who can't promote their own rights to uh, defend the defendless, yes. defenseless, if you want. I guess as we talk about genetic engineering, it, it looks like we're doing positive things for improving the quality of life uh, for basic populace. Um, you can also look at it, though, and say, in a way, we need a lot more of defending of the defenseless because all of us are defenseless against a, a runaway new life form bacteria that e mm -hmm. eats oil or whatever. If that should happen, decide it likes the oil in our hair. Yeah. Um, that, uh, how do we protect, defend the defenseless? How do we avoid, as we're trying to improve the quality of life, how do we, within the political legal structure, uh, defend the defenseless? Um, promote the rights of those who are not able to promote the rights, their rights themselves? Well, again, as with all of these questions, there's either no answer or no, nor, nor an easy answer. Um, I think one of the ways, again, that I mentioned uh, in the earlier program was uh, education. Um, and I think it, it happens that those people who are most defenseless are also those that are in greatest need of the education. Now, uh, some of those individuals uh, might not even be able to, to make use of that education, but I think uh, a very large proportion of our population uh, can, if given the chance, understand the options, um, understand the alternatives available. Now, in terms of the, uh, the um, idea of organisms escaping, I, I think there the government has an even greater responsibility not only for education but for regulation for, for setting standards. I think uh, the recombinant DNA uh, process of, of creating the restraints uh, was, well, it happened to be quite haphazard, actually, uh, but I think it was a very useful process. Uh, we had he very, very heated hearings in, in Boston. We had some very heated confrontations in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and uh, it causes, caused a lot of controversy, and I think, um, of course, one could at any, any point in time uh, find that there are organisms escaping, I suppose, but I think that, uh, at least from what I understand, that now the feeling is that there is much less chance under the standards uh, of retaining these uh, um, organisms are, are kept, that, you know, that the risk is extremely low. Now, there's always a risk involved with anything, so I suppose the question is how much of a risk should society take? And if there is, you know, one in a million chance of these organisms escaping a low enough risk or, or not? Um, so I suppose in the other action then is for somebody uh, in society uh, to make the decision what is acceptable risk. Um, and the same goes, I think, for future generations. We have to look at what kind of risk does this type of intervention have for future generations. I, I believe we should be looking at future generations, have maybe not make all of our decisions on the basis of what we think future generations would like, but at least include them in our, in our deliberations. Um, and I think we have to look very heavily at what are the risks involved, 
And then, most importantly, is it reversible or irreversible? Uh, in other words, if we go in and we change genes through gene therapy, uh, as far as we know, it's ir irreversible, uh, certainly irreversible in future generations as they're born from the gene. But um, so, so I think risk is, is important. But I don't, again, don't have any answer to that. Is. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've joined our program in progress, our guest is Dr. Robert Blank, Chairman of the Department of Political Science at the University of Idaho. As you know, we're in a six-week series dealing with DNA research and genetic engineering, and today we're talking about public policy and its role in this subject. Uh, Dr. Blank, I have a somewhat theoretical question. Uh, it's in the future, it's a possibility, and I, I know those are difficult to deal with, but I would like for your uh, expertise to show us and uh, give us this opportunity to let you theorize about it. At one time in this country, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled, prior to the Civil War, as you so well know, that, that slaves were property mm -hmm. and were not in independent uh, individuals and free, and we went through a great struggle to solve that issue. And now that you've indicated uh, that patents have been given to uh, scientists and others or corporations to, when they create new life, to mm -hmm. own it, are we looking at some time in the future that this advancement in technology will be so great that that life will take on the form of human uh, uh, form, uh, even and it may not include the natural process of, of birth? Will that mean that the day may come when our courts would have to face the issue that there is life that is owned by other individuals, and uh, will we go through another struggle uh, to deal with the rights of uh, of those beings? Well. I think the best way to approach this, this question is to accept the possibility of a clone. Um, and I, I don't know what the chances that of, of a human clone being produced are, but one of the suggestions for having a clone produced is as a spare parts mechanism. In other words, uh, many suggestions for having exa exact genetic duplicates are to increase the, the or increase propagation of the, the, the best of the gene pool and so forth. But one of the suggestions is that we each have a clone, and we have this clone in cold storage, and then whenever we need an extra part, say a kidney or a heart, or we simply have it transplanted. And that, since this clone is an exact genetic duplicate of us, um, that there would be no rejection problems. So we would accept it. Uh, that, uh, let's also assume then that that's that happens. Uh, then I think the question is, uh, do the clones have rights? And I, in other words, are they are they individuals? And uh, uh, just because they haven't had a mother and a father, just because they have come from a, a donor cell, uh, aren't they individuals? And I would imagine that that if that came to the Supreme Court, that would be a very interesting case. In other words, can these organisms be used for spare parts, or do they have their own life, their own? Uh, mentality, rational thinking capacity, and so forth. And from all standards that we could imagine, they would. And so I think that that question would theoretically, I would hope it would go in favor of the clones, but I think it would be that type of question. There are also other possibilities that have been raised, theoretical, but I think very um, disheartening possibilities, even in theoretical terms, of uh, man-ape chimeras, a uh, combination of man-ape species and so forth, and um, certain types of, of humans designed to do a particular tasks, uh, uh, very small humans uh, cloned to, to, you know, do inside work on jet airplanes or spaceships or whatever. And, um, I, I think this is, is, even talk of that type of thing, I think, is what scares many people about genetic technology in general. I myself would, would like to focus more on the technologies that are at hand and the applications and, and research at that level, but, I, but obviously, uh, since they are ultimately tied together and we talk about genetic intervention, um, could be sterilization, it could be artificial insemination, it could be a genetic screening, and it also could be cloning or manic chimera. So, so I think it, it's a real question. I don't know what the court would decide. I guess we'd decide how many, I mean, depend on how many clones there were around. Uh, but I do think there are some very dangerous aspects of genetic engineering when we get into those areas. Uh, very dangerous. Thank you. Richard Snyder. Have any scientists been 
expressing views on dealing with uh, the management of genetic engineering, uh, where genetic engineering should be used, how we should use it, uh, suggestions of how genetic engineering could improve uh, the human race or uh, any species for that matter in the future. Uh, I think in other places you've mentioned people like uh, Linus Pauling and Shockley. And mm -hmm. Well, I did mention at least uh, I think four different Nobel Prize winners who had uh, uh, suggested uh, various things, pa Linus Pauling suggesting uh, tattoos on the heads of carriers uh, so that they wouldn't uh, mate, uh, or at least they would be uh, put on caution that they're carriers and that there's a 25 percent chance that any child they have will have a disease. Uh, and the statement I suggested by uh, Joshua Ladeberg on if we find the perfect person, we should clone them rather than leave it to sexual recombination. Um, and those types of statements are, are quite common. Uh, Muller, H.J. Muller, I think was the first one who, who really con became concerned about the deterioration of the gene pool and who made basically his life work out of uh, a eugenic approach to um, uh, attempting to get around this deterioration, which he contended, and which many people who look at it contend, comes about by increased uh, or advances in medicine that keep alive uh, individuals who would have uh, died in the past. Um, so there are there are many statements by these by some of these individuals. On the other hand, Lederberg has recently said that he realized it was. Um, not plausible to use the eugenic argument any longer, and he suggested that the tact that should be used instead was to go towards an individualistic oriented approach. In other words, we should be using these technologies to overcome genetic disease, not to improve the gene pool. In other words, he saw that as a much more realistic approach to the application of genetic technologies. Um, we have then within the science community uh, even a, a range of opinions uh, and uh, I don't know if Lederberg and uh, Mueller and others uh, you know speak for the I, d I know they don't speak for the entire community uh, there are many uh, scientists uh, that are most in fact most of the early works on ethics in biomedicine came from scientists who were very concerned about the implications but I do think that the distinction in the past have been these sci scientists uh, represented by uh, Mueller and Lederberg uh, and Watson to some extent uh, and Pauling who are concerned with the gene pool argument, concerned with eugenics and other scientists, mostly the clinical people who are concerned with the applications and the use of these technologies to reduce genetic disease. So I think there are two arguments and th many times they're thrown together but I <coughs> think they're two completely different arguments. I, if I may. Uh, the other thing that comes to mind is the genocide that apparently was practiced in Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you think after 35 or 40 years uh, since that occurred, if that, that the very concept may still be overshadowing our own rational thinking about genetic engineering. You think that the fact that that was going on, attempts at genocide and so forth, might still be coloring our view to some extent and keeping us from making truly rational decisions about genetic engineering and future generations and so forth. Well, I think it is. I think I think it's that's right to some extent. Uh, on the other hand, I do think that some of the statements by some of the leading geneticists have not helped uh, eliminate that problem because I think they they simply you know further that. Um, uh, my feeling would be that we should eliminate the word eugenics. I think the word eugenics has become totally meaningless because it has taken on the connotations you mentioned. Uh, and I do think I would agree with those those geneticists who take a much more cautious approach and, and take an approach that uh, we should apply genetic technologies when uh, they can be done w protecting the rights of the individuals involved and also um, are aimed at treating those, in, uh, ultimately aimed at treating those individuals. And I, I think the distinction is becoming made more and more clear that when we talk about treating individuals, we're not talking about aborting, aborting fetuses 
that have a particular disease. I don't think most people see treatment as elimination. Uh, so ultimately, gene therapy of those individuals perhaps is what some of these people are aiming at. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think that the people that are concerned about the gene pool, and I've seen arguments both ways, and I'm, again, certainly not an expert in that area, I, I think that they are very serious about what they're doing, and I, I think they, they firmly believe that the gene pool is deteriorating, and uh, some of them have suggested that if, they, if there isn't a reversal, that in fact, uh, you know, the survival of the species in question. Um, but again, that's a very long-term future-oriented thing, and we tend not to look at decisions on that basis, at least at this point. So that's pretty much minimized, I think. Bob Murray. We keep hearing the example of amniocentesis being used to decide the sex of a child, whether a couple then will abort the fetus or not. And I don't think that's, my personal view is I don't think that's justification for amniocentesis. On the other hand, population is one of our major problems in all countries today. And it has been said that if we could guarantee the firstborn of every family be a male, that the population growth would be reduced 50% immediately. Is any political unit tackling this from this aspect? It's always been used as a bad aspect. Now is anybody going to turn this around and use it positive, either within our political boundaries or anywhere else? As far as I know, nobody politically is touching it. Um, uh, I, I think they're, they're very afraid to get into that, that area. Um, I, I don't think, like I, I mentioned, I think, in my talk, that I, I don't think this is going to be a problem very long because I think there are going to be other means. I mean, I'm told at least there are going to be other means that are less intrusive to predetermined sex. Uh, certain type of diaphragms that will screen out the male sperm or female sperm or uh, they have now a uh, centrifugal process where they, they have to be through artificial insemination. But there are other means, I think, uh, that will come about. Um, the question on, on amniocentesis now used for that purpose is, is one that John Fletcher, for instance, came out about four years ago against it on moral grounds and now said, well, he, is, if we have the resources and if the parents pay for it themselves, uh, that it's guaranteed under Roe versus Wade that a woman can abort for any reason, and uh, sex choice seems to be more realistic than convenience. So he agree he changed his mind. So I don't know. It's very questionable. I must interrupt. We're out of time again. Uh, thank you, Dr. Blank. It's been a pleasure having you here this well, two weeks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been Dr. Robert Blank, the chairman of the Department of Political Science at the University of Idaho. We've been discussing for two weeks public policy issues as it relates to DNA research and genetic engineering. I want to take this time to also recognize the Regional Campus Ministry Board of our area that's been very good to help us financially with this uh, symposium and these uh, TV interviews. We appreciate that very much. I also want to invite you to be with us again next week and the week after that when we'll have parts five and six with Dr. Martin Klein, a scientist at UCLA who is involved in genetic uh, research and he will be addressing uh, the question is, what should he or should he not be doing in his research? Please be with us. Have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at this same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by a North Idaho College student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.